Do you have any theories on why some guys can progress so fast in sports, Cyril Gan, and possess insane levels of fluidity while others train their whole lives and can't look like that? More physical or neurological? That's from Jasper. Jasper, I'll tell you something. That's a really great question. That's a question I've been asking myself for years. I'm, I've read so many books on training. I've trained with so many great trainers. I've researched the world all over. And I'll tell you one thing. It has a lot to do with your youth. What you did in your youth. Imagine trying to learn a language in your 30s or in your 20s. Let's say, for instance, you're trying to learn Arabic. Kif halak? Now, you hear my Arabic. I don't have an accent because I learned speaking Arabic at a young age. Now, if you try to say those words I just said, and you practice them from 10 years, you would still have an accent. A trained ear would be able to detect your accent. It's similar with athletics. If you learn athletics later on in life, okay? Now, I'm not saying, guys, I learned, I learned martial arts later on in life, okay? I started at the age of 20. My trainer, John Denahar, started at the age of 27. So I'm telling you, there are solutions to these problems. We're going to get to it. We've got to start slow. But there's a type of athletic accent. Some guys have an athletic accent. They move their bodies. They punch and kick. But it's, it seems weird. It seems herky-jerky. It doesn't seem fluid. It doesn't seem explosive. It's herky-jerky. There's an accent. Like when somebody who learns English from a foreign land, they come here, they speak English, you would know right away he's from a foreign land. Why? You hear his accent. He asks you for a Pepsi. Not, not a Pepsi, he asks you for a Pepsi. If he says Pepsi, if he's turning P's into B's, he's an Arab. I know right away he's an Arab. My children, they call me Baba. They don't call me Papa. In the French, they say Papa. In Arabs, we say Baba. We don't have the letter P. So when you teach them the letter P, they always have an accent. The B, the P turns into a B. It always sounds like a P and a B. It's a, it's a, it's a strange mix. What I'm trying to tell you is, when you learn athletics when you're young, you have an advantage. You definitely have an advantage. Great athletes are usually developed in youth. However, there are exceptions. You're gonna to point to this guy and that guy. Bernardo Hopkins learned to box at 27. That's true. I trained at 20 years old. I started training. But we did athletics before. Okay, and I wasn't deep into athletics when I was a young kid, but I did. I played sports. Bernard Hopkins didn't work behind a desk till he was 27 and then jumped into the ring. No, 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 no. He was probably a street fighter. He was probably a troublemaker. Maybe he ran track. He did something else that was demanding neurologically that's similar to boxing. He has to have. He has to have. All... Great athletes exploit their true potential when they're young. Now, I trained in athletics. I was a football fan. I played a little bit of hockey. I played a little bit of soccer. I wasn't deep into athletics, okay? Believe me, my parents didn't have extra change. They didn't have extra money to put me in extra curricular activities. So I had an accent. I had to work super hard around the clock to catch up to guys who knew a lot less than me, but they've been training since their youth. So when we're wrestling, you could tell that I know more, but these guys are just born fighters. You know, they're, they're, they've been... Since they're little kids, they've been wrestling. Since they're little kids, they've been punching and kicking. They have this advantage. And it's amazing because a lot of times guys who learn martial arts when they're young, they make very poor trainers. Very poor. Because they, th they do things in a way they don't even understand. Like if you ask them to show you a move, they're like, I think I would do this. I think I would do that. Like they're just kind of improvising. For them, it's like, think about when you talk English. Do you know all these grammar rules, guys? If you ask me grammar rules in English, if you ask, I would know very little. I'm very weak in grammar. However, I know how to speak English. Why? I heard it for so many. I heard it for 20 million. I've heard it for millions and millions of hours. I've listened to millions and millions of hours of English. I'm just doing it intuitively because I learned that at such a young age. I learned English. I was listening to English at such a young age. It's the same thing with martial arts. Like sometimes I watch my kids wrestle and they do moves I've never showed them. And I rewatch the tape and I'm like, what the hell did he just do? How did he do that? I rewatch the tape and it's bizarre. And I wonder to myself, would this work? Like I try it later on, but they're learning in a way that's intuitive. It's far superior for competition. If you look at all the best athletes, they're usually started training young. If you look at all the best instructors, all the best trainers, they usually started late. Why? Because they had to go out there and learn all the grammar rules. They had to go and learn how the engine actually works. 
So then when you come to them with a problem, they're like, oh, this is what's wrong with your engine. This is what's wrong with your transmission. This is what, They understand the, the rules and laws and principles behind the sport. Okay, so that's a very special thing. So number one, start in your youth, okay? Number two, choose your parents wisely. This is an old track and field saying. Choose your parents wisely. And of course you can't choose your parents, but a lot of it is genetic. A lot of it is genetic. You're asking me about Cyril Gan. Look, the guy is 250 plus and he moves like a cat. What made him 250 plus? Genetics. What made him move like a cat? Partly genetics, partly training. Let me explain, okay? Guys, if you noticed his training up to leading up to John Jones, he was doing a lot of stability work. They had him on these two stability balls and they were lifting up his feet. I've said it time and time again. I've talked to you guys about strong and stable knees. The best way to get good, because you're talking about genetics and then we're talking about coordination. Genetics, coordination. Genetics, coordination. This is key. If you bodybuild, let's say you're doing biceps and then triceps. Then you're doing hamstring curl. Yeah, you'll hypertrophy the muscle. The muscle will get bigger, but the muscle is dumb. It's not coordinated. You're teaching it to bend your arm like this and not move the rest of your body. When are you going to do this in a sport? You need total body movements. We need to develop coordination. We need to develop massive amount of coordination. So for instance, if I ask you to do a cartwheel, can you create momentum? Can you kick your legs up in the air? Can you get upside down, train your proprioceptors? You know, you're discombobulating yourself. You're upside. Do you have the coordination to do a cartwheel? If you're just doing bicep curls your whole life, you won't even have, eventually you won't, you'll never develop the ability to do a cartwheel. Now, a cartwheel tells me a lot about your, it's funny because when you see John Jones going to the octagon, he does a one-arm cartwheel, one arm. The guy's six foot, like he's six foot four, whatever he is. Go do a one-arm cartwheel. Try it. It's not easy. It's not easy to do a one-arm cartwheel, okay? They have high levels of coordination. How do you train coordination, okay? Coordination is two major components. One, you do total body movements. So let's say you do an Olympic lift. That's a total body movement. It's not bicep curl and tricep extension tricep extension you're just training your muscle back and forth you're doing something that creates requires such little coordination when we do our fitness routine when we go through conditioning we need to use total body movements we got to move away from trying to train just muscle groups okay there is there is some of that but we want to train total body movements when you look at strong and stable program okay Every exercise is a total body movement, almost every single one. Why? For this very purpose. And I use a lot of stability ball, a lot. Why? Stability, stability ball training teaches your brain how to control your muscle. It makes you a hyper level of coordination. If you guys ever see me roll, I'm sure you've seen me roll on this channel, you can see my coordination is very high. I move, I twist, I turn, I flip, I, I jump, I roll. This is all very demanding stuff. If you're not efficient at it, you'll gas out. Okay, so... Total body movements, stability ball training is a warp speed into... That's why I love it when they were training Cyril Gunn. I was just talking to my students about it today, actually. They, I was telling them, you see how even the top athletes, they stumble upon it, even though maybe they don't know that it's making them that good. Their trainer knows. Their trainer understands the importance of stability. They had him on this, like, two stability balls, and then they were lifting his feet up with a strap. I have the same exact exercise in Strong and Stable Back, guys. Make sure to pick up Strong and Stable Back. It's on special... Level up 50, the promo code is on your screen. Level up 50, get, get it half off, get strong and stable knees. Strong and stable knees is packed with exercises that will challenge your cardio, plyometrics, and high, high level of stability. Okay, I'm not going to get into it now. We talked about it many times. You have to train power, explosiveness, coordination. These guys are highly coordinated. So then when you teach them boxing and kicking and punching and rolling, they're super, super adept. Another thing I really like for coordination is tumbling, like dive rolling, back rolling, uh, cartwheels, like basic gymnastics. You don't have to go and, on the pummel horse, guys. You don't need that. You're a martial artist. You don't need that much. But if you look at wrestlers, when they warm up, and I'm not talking about shrimping along the mat 50,000 times. That's all, like, if it's not challenging, you're wasting your time. Like, I hate those jujitsu jitsu warm-ups where... 30 minutes of the class is shrimping up and down and doing these little weird crawls. And then like, like if I did that with my pros, they would all leave. And then you're doing this little weird exercise. It does, if it's not challenging, it's a waste of time. It has to be challenging. Okay. I just released a, 
Um, Turtle Escapes Made Easy. Okay, check it out. The beginning of the video is five progressions. First one is basic Granby roll. Number two is Granby roll from all fours. Number three is Granby roll from four points. Number five, uh, number four is diving shoulder roll. Number five is diving Granby roll. Well, guys, if you can do a diving Granby roll, I tip my hat to you. I guarantee you 99% of grapplers out there, they cannot do a diving Granby roll. How do I, how do I know? I make my guys warm up with these progressions and maybe three, four guys can do a diving Granby roll. Even black belts, they can't do a diving, not a diving shoulder roll, a diving Granby roll. So I teach you three progressions to Granby, then one shoulder roll, diving shoulder roll, and then I ask you, I ask you to mix shoulder roll with Granby roll. If you can hit that and somebody's on your back and you dive into a Granby, believe me, he'd have to be elite to stay on your back. Okay, it's a simple maneuver. I love tumbling, tumbling. That's why I start my warm-ups often with tumbling. Mainly Granby roll, not shrimping, because shrimping is pointless. Why? Because that's as good as you're going to get. You could shrimp up and down the, the mat for 10 years. Your shrimp is still the same as the guy who's been doing it for two months. Okay, they did a test once. You know, the ladder training. Okay, so you put a ladder on the floor and people do their footwork drills across the ladder. They measured people after six weeks of training, then after five years of training. Okay, the amount of progression they made in six years plateaued for the next five. So after doing it for six weeks, it's almost pointless to do it anymore. You're at your max speed. It's shrimping is the kind of same same way. You're not going to shrimp any faster or harder. You got your maximum once because shrimping is so simple of a technique. If something is not challenging, you're wasting your time. If something is not challenging, you're wasting your time. Now, it, it also you don't want it to be impossibly hard. It has to be difficult but manageable. People always ask me, how many reps, how many sets? I always tell them, look, if you're building power, it's five reps or less. If you're building endurance, it's 15, 20 reps or more. How many sets, how much weight? It has to be challenging but manageable. That's the key. You have to find the right number. You have to find the right amount of weight. It has to be challenging but manageable. If it's too challenging, you're going to break your back. Okay? You're going to fry your wheels. If it's too easy, you're not going to get much benefit from it. Okay, so you you got to experiment. Any tra No trainer in the world can know how many reps and sets. They're all just guessing. They kind of give you an evaluation in their mind of how many reps and sets would be challenging without killing you, and they'll give you that reps and sets. But really, they're really guessing. It's better to teach you that tool to learn how to manage your own reps and sets as your training. Guys, with that said, okay, let me recap real quick. One, it's... We said, what was that? We were talking about like making sure you uh, choose your parents wisely. You can't do that. Okay. So your genetics, you're born with them. Okay. Uh, actually, no, sorry. One was learning athletics in your youth. Doesn't necessarily have to be martial arts. If you did track and field in your youth, if you were, I don't know, um, I don't know, a hockey player in your youth. Guys, hockey players are fantastic at converting to a martial arts. Why? Because think about it. Skating. I've trained many hockey players. Okay. I live in Canada. They're doing a plyometric. It's almost like running without the impact. Skating is a phenomenal exercise for the legs. It's so explosive. It's very difficult. For those of you who have never skated, it's a highly, highly plyometric exercise. It's sprinting on skates. You're sprinting up and down the ice. You're stopping. You're going. It's a crazy cardio workout, and you got to slap the puck sometimes. It's very good for throwing punches. You're doing something dynamic with your upper body. You're working your abs. You're working in explosive fashion. Okay, so start young. Be blessed with genetics. That's something out of our control. Condition the entire body for coordination, tumbling, stability exercise, total body movements, total body movements. Other than that, I will tell you guys, look, find a really good instructor and be a very good student. These are two very important things, okay? You can't really change your genetics, but this is one you can really make a big difference, okay? Find a good gym, be a good student. What's a good student? A good student trains regularly. Avoid injuries like the plague. I'm going to say that again. Avoid injuries like the plague. Once you get injured, it's time out. I don't care how mentally tough you are. I don't, care how I don't care how motivated you are to make it. If your arm is broken, if your leg is broken, if your ankle is broken, if your neck is broken, you got bigger problems. Your body's saying no, and even though the mind is saying yes, you can't, go move. you can't move forward. Avoid injuries like the plague. Do stability ball training. It's the best way to avoid injury. I'll tell you why, okay? Do a workout with the stability ball. You'll notice... You'll, you won't be sore afterwards, okay? Maybe the first few workouts, if you're new, the noobs, you'll get a little bit sore, but watch after 
maybe 10 sessions with a stability ball, you're, you're almost never sore. If you work with weights and kettlebell, and I love weights and kettlebell, and I love sprinting, and I love all these other tools, I'm just telling you the stability ball has one very special aspect to it. It doesn't make people sore. So you're strengthening your abs, you're strengthening your legs, you're strengthening your upper body, but the next day you're not sore. You can do your boxing, your stretch, your, your wrestling, your jiu-jitsu. It doesn't impact recovery as much. That's a major, major plus for guys who are training heavily, okay? Now, I will tell you, it boosts performance. I will tell you, that's one of the number one tools ever. The one thing that made me fall in love with Stability Ball, okay? It made me fall in love with it. it, it, it to this day, I still work with it. I'll tell you what happened with me. I was doing gymnastics training with George, and we're doing muscle-ups, and I could usually hit like three good muscle-ups, and it was muscle-ups are very tough, and I'm talking about on rings, okay, not on a bar. On a bar, it's really easy. And then I had injured my shoulder, so I did an SSL program, sports science lab. I did their shoulder recovery program. I did my, my whole body with a stability ball. I learned a lot of stability ball training with the sports science lab, okay? Of course, my stability ball training, I find it to be, I just took the progressions further. They're more difficult, my exercises. Anyways, I hadn't done gymnastics for a month because I had injured my shoulder. I go back on the rings. I hadn't touched the rings in a month. I've been doing stability ball training. I hit seven muscle-ups. Me and GSP were freaking out. I, I never did seven muscle-ups. Like, my max before was three or four. And I did seven easy. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what is it? What, like, and I was realizing I just did a month of stability ball training. But I, had, I, was, I was shocked because I knew that I would, on a good day, I would do three muscle-ups in a row. Uh, it shocked me. And I think it had a lot to do with my abs. It really, really took my abs to the next level. So when you're doing muscle up, it's not just shoulders and upper body and back. No, no, no. The abs, the tighter their abs, the less you bleed, the less power is, is bleeding. The more sturdy you are, the easier it is for your upper body to pull you up. So since then, I've been doing stability, stability ball religiously. Like I always knew the importance of stability, stability ball, but that really freaked me out. That I was able to hit more than double my normal amount of reps. Um, what else is there to getting really good? Uh, I would say consistency. Don't overtrain. Train enough and hard enough that you can make it the next day. Don't go in on Monday, kill yourself, and then it takes till Thursday for you to go back in the gym. That's the biggest mistake noobs make. They come in, they train too hard, they get hurt, they get injured, they're out for a while, they come back, they seesaw back and forth, and they're in this funk. Forget that. Build. Guys, there's a reason why when you were young, they told you the story about the tortoise versus the hare. Slow and steady wins the race. Somebody was really wise and was like, I'm going to teach this lesson to the next generation of youth. And he made up that story so that the kids could realize the importance of taking one step at a time. It's better to train 70% every day, six days a week, than it is to train 100% on Monday, then 100% on Thursday, and then 100% on Saturday. And you, you need those long breaks in between. Believe me, the guy who's training daily, he's going to pass you quick. It's all about punching in, getting in a good workout, coming back the next day. Don't kill yourself so badly that you need a month to recover. 